And welcome back to Think Tech. Welcome back to Global Connections. Uh, we are honored to have today uh, Michael Curtis Davis, uh, and he's going to talk about his new book, Freedom Undone. Wow. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. I, it's my pleasure. I'm always glad when I'm back in Hawaii. And we are too, but uh, we're always troubled by your your lens toward Hong Kong. Uh, so let's let's talk about the current status of Hong Kong so we can frame up the book. Well, you know, the, the new security law has been draconian. A lot of people, uh, including very important, prestigious people in the society, the open society that used to be in Hong Kong, have been jailed or or uh, rooted out, routed out of Hong Kong, and uh, and now we have a, a a shell of its former self, right? What's it like there now? Well, it, it's basically freedom undone. <laughs> That's the title. Uh, I uh, I think what they're going after, they're trying. It, it's an interesting project in that Hong Kong is an example of what has now become common in the world, where authoritarian regimes promote an illiberal agenda, where they can pretend they're still following all the laws and stuff, and they, they claim to have the rule of law but they undermine and hollow out those liberal institutions that provide the safeguards and accountability. That's Hong Kong today. So people are, are arrested. Uh, most of my friends in Hong Kong are in jail or, or they fled and they're in exile. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the new norm. Uh, you don't speak up. I have one academic friend who's trying to uh, navigate a very thin line, uh, hoping that, uh, that academic, I don't want to say anything about the person, can publish in English overseas and not not suffer any uh, response. Uh, so it's very cautious academic community in the city now, uh, which is very important because in Hong Kong, uh, like in many Asian societies, uh, university faculty often have a very prominent role in public debates. Uh, they're consulted by the media all the time. I have been myself for many, many years, uh, and uh, they help to shape the public debate. So when the academic community has gone silent out of fear, uh, then uh, a lot of the kinds of issues that could be brought up. So accountability by law, legal institutions is one side, but the lack of accountability by the public is another, uh, achieved by silencing the press and, and arresting some prominent uh, people in the press, and uh, by creating a, an election model called patriotic educate uh, elections. Excuse me. There's also patriotic education. Uh, but euphemisms patriotic galore. Now you're yeah. you're an academic. Uh, you were at Hong Kong University for many years. You taught many students there, and you're still an academic uh, with Jindal Global University. Or you you appear there as a fellow, and also in Woodrow Wilson uh, Center, you appear there as a fellow. So um, the lens at the lens through which you look at Hong Kong is what an academic lens. Describe to us how you know that lens works in writing your book. Well, what I try to do in this book is I don't want to just sell the book in the academic market, you know, the, the university libraries and so on, because I'm writing on an urgent issue that the world needs to understand. It has implications for Hong Kong people, many of them in exile, because those are the ones that are going to be allowed to read it. Uh, but it has implications for the rest of us, because uh, this illiberal trend is finding its voice in all sorts of ways, uh, either imposed by, uh, you know, dictatorial leaders or uh, promoted by authoritarian regimes like China and Russia. So I kind of write the book from the lens that this is a model that China, its vision of how to run what looks like an open society, but is not. Uh, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is that I live there and I, I taught students. They're in the government. They're in the opposition. They're in jail. They're all over the Hong Kong. Uh, by now, I guess, thousands of them. And uh I live in the society, and so I wanted to tell this story so that ordinary readers could read this book, and not just the academic consumers. Uh, and I bring in some of my own personal story. I don't load it up with that, but where I was, had a front row seat on something I'm discussing, and I literally discuss what happened from 1997 forward in the lens of this sort of constitutional 
illiberalism. Uh, and uh, when I'm on a front row seat, like I was one of the founder organizers of the Article 23 uh, you know, concern group that led protest uh, the, in 20, uh, uh, 2003, excuse me. Uh, so these kinds of things, I, I bring that part in because I want the book to be readable uh, by people across society and not just an academic tome. So uh, hopefully I succeed. I chose this particular publisher for that reason. Mm -hmm. They call it shorts, although my book is nearly 300 pages. Uh, but uh, they, their their aim is to reach outside the academy, and I choose them for that reason. Uh, I'm not building a resume anymore. I want to reach the, reach the a wider readership. Well, something you mentioned really, really touches me, and that is this is a, a kind of an examination into what China has done in Hong Kong um, as a um, scary learning experience, if you will, uh, for us to look at other autocracies around the world uh, and see, you know, the comparisons. Um, and and it is very scary what happened. I, mean, uh, I was telling you about this uh, YouTube video I caught of, of done by The Economist, uh, which has actually millions of views. And it, it told me that I that things I didn't know. For example, not too long after the takeover, uh, China started to infiltrate the individuals, the leaders, and the institutions in Hong Kong in order to ramp up to a time when uh, it would take over uh, early, earlier than, what, 2047. And um, <clears throat> this is a very scary story. And you mentioned you covered that in the book. And I, I think um, that is a lesson we all need to know about. It's those euphemistic names, the lies, the exaggerations, um, and the compromises and corruptions of democratic leaders, uh, all with a view toward um, you know, the spreading the autocracy into a given target state like Hong Kong. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, we call what actually the Chinese way of approaching things in general, it falls under, especially overseas, something called United Front. Uh, and the United Front uh, tries to uh, develop friends and identify those and target enemies. Uh, and uh, if someone is sort of in the middle somewhere trying to be moderate, they may be approached and try and, and be cultivated and, and somehow rewarded. And I think that a lot of that was done with the business community in Hong Kong. You know, instinctively, businessmen should be against communism, you know, because it doesn't treat them very well. But, you know, China sort of created in Hong Kong this and, and in generally in China itself, of course, China is no longer a communist state. It has a communist party ruling it, but it's very much uh, committed to lots of market uh, strategies. Uh, and so it uses these strategies and it, it, it rewards those it favors. Uh, the problem with it is this becomes a kind of form of corruption because it means that if you go along to get along, then you win. You, you get uh, contracts, you get appointments. So a lot of Hong Kongers would be appointed. This started way before the handover, by the way, mm. way back in the late 80s and into the 90s. Uh, China was cultivating, especially the business community in Hong Kong. And then there were parties set up. There was a DAB party, which was a pro-Beijing party, a kind of more grassroots uh, leftist orientation, pro-communist and then there were the business elites. Uh, one of the most prominent parties there was the Liberal Party. And there was never full elections. So all you're voting for is maybe half of the legislative council and, and the district council. Uh, the chief executive, they, they didn't deliver the promised universal suffrage for choosing the chief executive, but tried to deliver a model in, uh, claiming they were upholding their promise, which isn't a basic law of universal suffrage, a model where they would choose the candidates and then everybody could vote on their candidates. And so it was interesting when more recently they imposed this new electoral model, even for the legislature, uh, that, which basically a patriots only election, which was imposed in 2021, they, some of the candidates that were running didn't have an opposition. So Beijing reportedly trying to encourage them to find somebody to oppose them. You know, so this kind of version of elections, even for now, only 20 percent of the legislature is directly elected. It used to be 50 percent. 
And, and now uh, most of the seats are filled by people appointed by Beijing in one form or another. So th this is what they do. You recruit and then you appoint. You, if it's a business, you give business advantages and so on. And it's kind of, it's not the old style corruption that Hong Kong used to have, you know, way back when, where people pay petty bribes. It's a kind of corrupting of the whole system. And then you control all outcomes. Uh, and so anything that would threaten those outcomes is, is a problem. That's why I pointed out that the basic law had two basic flaws, even before all this crackdown occurred. One was that Beijing had the ultimate power of interpretation, and the other was that Beijing was dragging its feet on delivering the promised universal suffrage. And this those... examination is so important. Yeah, you know the euphemisms, the, the, the this uh, this kind of yeah, internal um, corruption, uh, and you know what? It reminds me of what Vladimir Putin is doing in in um, the Balkans and and uh, all of Eastern Europe, west of Ukraine. And he's trying to corrupt from the inside. And, you know, it works because people buy into it. Uh, it it's very clever. And, and so your book becomes totally relevant in examining this whole process of, of the autocrat reaching out to take over neighboring countries uh, without firing a shot. And that's what we have here. Uh, you know, and I remember uh, just a, a short story, Michael. I remember uh, being in Hong Kong at a, at a, at a function where there were a lot of you know, people who were the leaders of the city. This is this would be way before the umbrella movement. And I said, "What do you think of the Chinese?" To some business guy sitting next to me, uh, you know, are they are they troubling you when they come in? And he says, "No, no, 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 no. We're very friendly with them. Uh, they make it easy for us." Um, and, and I I take it now, looking back down the road, that he he and his organization had been corrupted already. Um, and and they they didn't sweat the, um, the the umbrella movement because they were in China's pocket already. So step by step, you take over all of the elements of that free society and make it unfree. Right, and and it's interesting because the first generations of of these businessmen were Hong Kong elites who were given the sweetheart deals. Uh, and and what what's happening now though is because Beijing has a lot of you know, a face to save uh, in keeping Hong Kong's economy going is more and more mainland business elites are now in Hong Kong and they've even formed a political party. Uh, and so what will happen is that this older generation will no longer be uh, useful. Uh, the, these uh, guys like the guy you were probably talking to will no longer be useful. They won't be needed anymore. They were needed when Hong Kong was one of the freest societies in the world. But now where Beijing controls the shots and controls what business elites do uh, in Hong Kong, because it has its own you know, ge new generation of them, uh, then uh, those other guys either have to find ways to move their investment somewhere else and leave town, or at least hedge their bets in some ways, uh, if they want to continue to enjoy the largesse. What I don't understand, Michael, is why China, the management of China, the leadership of China is like this. Why, why are they so relentlessly, um, you know, aggressive? Uh, why are they um, building military facilities in the South China Sea? Why are they trying to corrupt uh, Hong Kong and so many other places? Um, why do they have a police station in Brooklyn? You know, remember that story. Um, why, why are they so aggressive? Why is it sort of manifest destiny? kind of thing? What makes them do this? Why don't they just relax a little bit? Well, I think what you're seeing, and, I, the, and this I emphasize a lot in the book, that China, the Communist Party, not China as per se, but the Communist Party of China views continuance of Communist Party rule as imperative, that this has to be maintained. But it's tricky because when you have a society with more and more free market strategies, to compete in the world, which China has had over the last year since Deng Xiaoping, uh, then uh, it's 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 tricky to keep the Communist Party in power because uh, academics will tell us, political economists will tell us that eventually uh, the free market ideas cause a kind of mass movement that pushes aside authoritarian leaders. So how do you do that? Well, 
the Communist Party leaders view liberal ideas as an existential threat. And I go into this, that's a, at the heart of the book. They view that as an existential threat. And so they have to suppress it wherever it arises. These are the inclinations that would overthrow a communist party, would say, we no longer need these kind of leaders. We want more open society, which is natural sort of human thing to do. So you nip these things off at the butt. And, and that's kind of what's happening. Now, Hong Kong, in this analysis, Hong Kong beca became a major threat because it was literally the home of liberal ideas and institutions, even though it wasn't fully democratic, the combination of, you know, the guarantees of autonomy and, and you know, which was very limited, but nonetheless there, and hit the history of the rule of law in Hong Kong meant that it was very much a liberal constitutional order. It is not any longer. Well, you know, I suggest to you that uh, to the extent that it was a major threat to Beijing, um, and despite the fact that they've done a lot to squash that, um, it, the memory of it, the, the, the narrative of it, the story of it is still a major threat. Um, and, uh, for example, other countries are scared or intimidated, and they connect up what happened in Hong Kong with what might happen with them, uh, that kind of infiltration, uh, that kind of corruption. Uh, and I, I think, I think um, you know, the Philippines may be a good example of that. We have a, a correspondent in the Philippines who, uh, who works in and with, um, you know, the Marcos government now. Um, and they are very concerned with what uh, China is doing in the Philippines. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think at the end of the day, this is precisely what Beijing wants to nip in the bud uh, in terms of uh, this man's concern and the expression of it on the one hand. And on the other, Beijing wants to promote globally. It has a national security concept that it first applied nationally and more recently articulated globally that basically it wants to teach its friends and people that it can reward and gain friendship with. Uh, it wants to teach them how to do what Beijing does, to do Beijing style, where the leaders uh, can nip off any kinds of political threats. So the Philippines is sort of a classic case of the long years of autocratic rule, uh, then some uh, democracy, but not economic success that it would like, and the democracy not achieving its goals as much as it would like. And then you get Duterte tilting the thing back both towards more authoritarian rule and towards China. And now we have Marcos, which is still a work in progress. Uh, he seems to be at least different than his father. Uh, and uh, we, we don't know which direction he'll go, but he seems to be shifting away from that tilt towards Beijing. Uh, and so then Beijing is feeling threatened because it's been trying to claim all of the South China Sea. Uh, and it, you know the tribunal that heard this matter ruled in favor of the Philippines. So now the Philippines, I think, wants to sort of step up its game and have a more vigorous defense of its territorial seas. Uh, and uh, China's got the opposite view. Uh, and so part of China's global strategy is to expand its influence in the region and uh, access to the wider oceans nearby, and at the same time exercise influence globally through its vision of how to govern. And in that context, I think Hong Kong becomes a kind of prototype of, of Beijing's vision. So if it can make this work satisfactorily in Hong Kong, then it can sell it. Well, if I were a Filipino uh, reading your book, I would be very concerned because there are elements that are very similar to um, you know, what, what uh, China has done in Hong Kong. The infiltration uh, among leaders and institutions to corrupt them. Um, and to bring them into, you know, in, into the Chinese uh, web, so to speak. Um, that's happening in, in the Philippines, too. Uh, maybe not to the same extent that it happened in Hong Kong, but if I were a Filipino reading your book, I would have great concern, and I would see your book as a primer um, on how this works and what to do about it. Right. That's exactly the spirit in which I tried to write the book. I spent over 30 years there in Hong Kong watching this stuff unfold day by day. And having the privilege, because of what I teach as constitutionalism and human rights, to participate in those debates when Hong Kong was an open society. Uh, and so I, I want to share that experience in the book, both in, on a personal level and in terms of uh, what issues are at stake 
and what to watch. Well, and, and clearly Beijing uh, likes to promote this illiberal model. And so this has become a global battle, which I hadn't anticipated when I started down this path. But it's become a much bigger uh, matter than it was uh, when Hong Kong had, uh, you know, some level of autonomy and was carrying on doing business and mostly staying out of global politics. Uh, now it's very much a, a sort of poster child of one kind of concern in the widening global debate between liberal and illiberal uh, government. Which shows no sign of, of stopping. No sign of slowing down. You, know, you hardly know where China will stop in all this. With yeah. Belt Road and all that, I mean, it 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 uh, it, it, it seeks uh, markets and areas of influence far beyond China, far beyond Asia. So right. let me ask you, um, you know, the important question of the week, and that is um, uh, Taiwan. Um, Taiwan had an election a few days ago, um, and a mm, liberal Democrat won, uh, Lai Ching Te. And he is um, he's willing to talk to China, although they're not they've been criticizing him a lot uh, and they're not necessarily willing to talk to him. But he's in favor of democracy and he's, um, you know, very articulate about it. And so the question is, uh, how do the people of Taiwan feel about, um, you know, um, the problems in your book, the problems with China in Hong Kong? Uh, how did that affect this election? How did it affect previous elections? How, how will it affect future elections in Taiwan? Um, they would love, that they, the Chinese, would love to take over Taiwan. I imagine they have a big plan to do that um, without firing a shot, by the way. Same thing. But query how far have they gotten, how far will they get? Well, this is, is the huge, it's like the front line now. Hong Kong was. Now this is it on Beijing's sort of agenda to, you know, capture and hold all the territory that it's trying to claim. And Taiwan, of course, is at the top of the list. Uh, locally, I just spent the last two weeks there. Uh, locally, the uh, people I talked to, I, th I think in a way they try to not even think about Beijing's agenda. Uh, a lot of the election debate was just about economic issues and, you know, lifestyle issues that people face. But sort of lurking behind it, and certainly uh, to the advantage of the, 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 the election winner, uh, was uh, this idea that there is a China threat, and and they're very much aware uh, across the society of what happened in Hong Kong. We were told uh, by people who study this more carefully that the last election with where Tsai Ing won won her election was especially helped by uh, the ongoing crisis in Hong Kong at the time. Uh, and this election, I think Hong Kong was mentioned last, but people don't forget. They they know what kind of model Beijing is promoting and they don't want it. Uh, they're sort of hoping between people supporting the KMT or the DPP, uh, they're hoping just to maintain the status quo. They, 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 they don't think they can take a move in a, either direction uh, safely. So that's kind of what they're, I think the majority view is. And that caused a kind of split, uh, not down the middle, but close to it. Uh, between the two parties, a third party got some of the votes, you know, 26 percent, I think, on president. So that's where it's at. And I think it's as you know, I've been dealing with Taiwan. I, I wrote an article about Taiwan so many years ago called The Concept of Statehood and the Status of Taiwan. And ever since then, it's these basic issues have stayed more or less the same. They, there's not a lot of shift on that. And, and uh, the two parties just offer different visions of how to get along with Beijing. And the people have to interpret this in terms of threat. If I lived in Taiwan, I'd be concerned about the lack of uh, um, countries with which Taiwan had diplomatic relations. Um, and what I understand is in the run-up to this election a few days ago, um, China was um, doing a lot of criticism uh, of Lai ching Te uh, and everything he stood for, public criticism and all this press. Um, and furthermore, uh, they managed to to make a deal with Nauru, Nauru, which yeah. did was one of the dozen countries that had diplomatic relations uh, with Taiwan to wean them away from Taiwan. And the latest news uh, is that they 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 promised to pay uh, Nauru enormous sums of money if it would cut diplomatic ties. So you have this operating on a number of fronts. 
Um, they don't have to do that for Hong Kong. They already have Hong Kong. But in Taiwan, they're doing, you know, not, not only the threat of kinetic war, not only this infiltration, but also the, um, the disruption of Taiwan's relations with other countries. Yeah, that's in the book. I, I like to emphasize I, a lot of the book talks about just how systematic they are. It's almost genius the way they cultivate people and the way they manipulate and channel and, and impose ideas and laws and, and so on. It's not just a kind of shoot from the hip stuff. Uh, they didn't need to send the PLA into Hong Kong, they, they sent something more dramatic. Uh, and so this is kind of the vision. Now, Nauru is an interesting case. So, you know, it's only a small island with a few thousand people. Actually, as a young lawyer in Hawaii, one of the first cases I handled involved Nauru, where one of the leaders was uh, the, suing a newspaper who accused him of separatist movements. So this is going way back. And so I know very much about Nauru. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it sells mostly iguana. Uh, that's kind of thing that it markets. So, so Beijing, you know, will go get any ally it can. Uh, it, it's not a big player, but uh, it's just basically cutting down the score that Taiwan has in terms of, I think, now down to 12 countries, uh, very small ones, that have relations with Taiwan uh, in a formal way and not with Beijing. Where does it go from here, Michael? I mean, I, I think your your book is not only important in terms of giving us a handle on what China has been doing, what it is doing vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong, um, but also a look forward. Uh, what will it do? Will it continue these same machinations? Will it continue the same corruptions, threats, what have you, um, uh, attempts to uh, shift the leadership, so to speak, both in political and uh, commercial terms? Um, will that stay the same? Is that, will that playbook continue, or will we see some other uh, clever tricks to undo any uh, democratic notions in Hong Kong? I think they'll stick more or less with this formula because it's well tried and tested. Uh, as long as the Communist Party is ruling uh, with a, this cast of leaders, uh, then their imperative, as I mentioned earlier, is to keep the party in power. Uh, and their th biggest threat is our liberal ideas and values being promoted by activists around the world. Uh, and so I think that that is just part of their agenda. They will temper it sometimes when they're suffering, their economy's suffering now. So they reached out to the U.S. and they, they're trying to not uh, upset the apple cart on trade with the U.S. and Europe, which they depend a lot on. So that's kind of where they're at in this kind of balancing act. Uh, but I think these strategies are well tested and used at home. And uh, uh, that's more or less what they promote abroad. What I think is more interesting today that's happened is in the old days, it was just about at home. The biggest national security threat for Beijing for most of its existence uh, under communist leadership was its own people. Uh, and this idea that if they acquired liberal values like 1989 threatened to express that this was doomed for the Communist Party to rule. Uh, I think what's happening now is they're expanding this idea. They, they describe their own self as having a whole process, people's democracy. So they think they're promoting democracy wherever they go. And they've gone global. They've come up with national security concepts for national level, for Hong Kong and for global application. So this is kind of expansion, not a contraction of all of this. Only end you could see and possibly in sight is if another sort of Deng Xiaoping-like figure came along that questioned it, that if Xi Jinping's policies fail in some dramatic way and he starts getting pushback at home, uh, then we can only guess you know, what could happen. Well, they used to say, uh, as, as General Motors goes, uh, so goes the country, uh, and I and I and I hesitate to say that as as the China experiment in squashing Hong Kong goes, uh, so goes autocracy around the world. Uh, you know, to the extent that they have succeeded and that they will continue to succeed, and that they, you know, their 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 branding of Hong Kong uh, will continue, and that sends a message. It sends a message to Vladimir Putin, uh, to the guy in Hungary. Um, to uh, uh, Erdogan in uh, Turkey, 
and other autocrats and would-be autocrats uh, will take heart by the fact that, yes, you can pretend to be a people's democracy, and you can squash your neighbors into submission, and it works, and it stays, and nobody can escape you. This is, this is a very uh, important message to some people. And I'm, I'm worried that they, uh, they are um, they're enhancing the possibility of autocracy in a number of places by what happened in Hong Kong. Yeah, I would add that they also enhance it not just in a number of places, but in our own country and, and Western Europe and elsewhere, where now in all of these polities, in UK is quite, uh, you know, the Brexit and all of that was part of this, uh, is certain illiberal trends. Uh, in Israel, we see them trying to disempower the courts. We see that in certain countries in the European Union. Uh, we see in the United States a kind of a lot of illiberal ideas being promoted uh, by political leaders, uh, various factions in the Congress and so on, uh, where genuine open democracy is viewed as a threat to their position and they're happy to try to limit voters' uh, access and so on. So the illiberal trend, it, uh, you know, Beijing's version of it is part of it, uh, and uh, but it is a much wider application uh, that we need to keep an eye on. Yeah, you, know, you say illiberal trend. I mean, I think what 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 is inherent, inherent in that is the, the a new brand of quote democracy as a euphemism. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people who are actually um, very illiberal call themselves um, purveyors of democracy, but in fact. China says that its system is better than American democracy. Right. Uh, that we and we are deteriorating, we are declining while they are ascending. And so that message is all around the world. We used to be we used to try to sell democracy. Now they're selling their brand of democracy, even though it is nowhere close to democracy. The right. Comments- we see what's happening in the US Congress where it's virtually incapable of making policy decisions anymore. Uh, we see uh, elections where leaders are more about self-promoting than uh, policy uh, formulas. Uh, and so all of this uh, polarization that we're seeing, uh, and it's a difficult thing to cure, but it's all sort of in this same trend. Uh, and it's the same kind of threat to democracy, ultimately, uh, because what I describe in Hong Kong is once these liberal guarantees are taken away, freedoms go out the door. Uh, the people's power, uh, accountability of the leaders to the people goes out the door. Uh, the book goes through this in great length, uh, not just that it's a kind of philosophical debate, but it's a very practical debate. And I try to present it in that way. Well, Hong Kong is a laboratory for the whole world. Yeah. Hong Kong is a lesson, an experience. That we all have to know about. Go, in my view, um, you know, the book goes way beyond Hong Kong, and it, it touches subjects we ought to be concerned about everywhere, every moment. You want to make any uh, final remarks here, Michael? Well, I, I think we've covered it pretty well. So uh, my idea in doing that was exactly what you just said: is to to highlight this thing that happened. I had a chance to see it up close. Uh, and unfolding for many years. And, and I felt, you know, in this stage, in my academic life, that th- this was something I should uh, try to bring out because maybe a uh, few people have had the same uh, opportunity to, to address it in this way. So I hope it's useful for people. And, and I, I'm going to be making tours. I'm going to London in a couple of weeks uh, to do book tour there. Uh, and uh, I just came from Taiwan. Uh, it's not anti-China. It's it's raising concern about what's happening. Uh, I think it's a, ought to be a concern for China, Chinese people as well. Uh, and so uh, that's the spirit of it. Uh, obviously, I spent my whole life in and around China. I have great love for the Chinese people, and uh, I, I want to uh, share my observations in, in that light. Thank you. It's a contribution to the global community. Where's the book available, Michael? It's now yeah, you guys are the pre 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 talks and the pre launch. <laughs> it's supposed to be formally launched on February seventh, uh, and it's supposed to go up on Columbia University Press web, website real soon. I'm asking them to let me know as soon as it does. Uh, they've even made a video promoting the book already, uh, which I'll make available on social media. 
Uh, and uh, this uh, this is kind of uh, I'll. I, when I'm in England, I've been told there will be copies of the book. Uh, so I start there on February 12th. There will be copies of the book uh, available to them on display. So, so very soon. Okay, don't forget we want to we want to discuss your next book with you also. Yeah, and, and Columbia University Press. Uh, the, the, get to the question of how to order it. Just uh, Google "Freedom Undone." I don't think anyone else has had this title before. Uh, <laughs> Google that and. Uh, you know, if it doesn't show up this week, it should next or, or soon right after. Michael Curtis Davis of Jindal Global University and Woodrow Wilson Center, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Aloha.